بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام الأتمان الأكملان على خير خلق الله أجمعين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهديه استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزيدنا علما وأين الحق حقا ورزقنا اتباعه وأين الباطل باطلا ورزقنا اجتنابه واجعلنا ممن يستمعون القول فيتبعون أحسنه آمين وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Last week we covered the last method used by Quraysh to attempt to stop the spread of Islam and to stop the Prophet from continuing in his da'wah. And what we looked at mainly last week was the persecution. The persecution that the Sahaba faced. And so this persecution it started around the fourth year of the prophethood. Around the fourth year of the prophethood. And it gradually intensified until it reached the unbearable limits around the middle of the fifth year. Around the middle of the fifth year of Al-Bi'atha, of the prophethood of the Prophet And so continuing to live under these circumstances had proven to be extremely difficult for the Muslims. And so the time had come to look for a solution. The time had come to look for a solution. And so Um Salama radiallahu anha, she narrates, and Um Salama was who? Who was she? She was one of the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa But at that time she wasn't married to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa She says, when Mecca became unbearable to live in, and the companions of Rasulullah were persecuted all for the sake of their deed, and they knew Rasulullah was unable to do anything about it, while he was protected by his uncle, and none of that which was happening to his companions was happening to him. At that point, Rasulullah said to them, In the land of Abyssinia, there is a king whom no one is dealt with unjustly. So go to his country so that Allah can grant you relief from that which you are currently in. Um Salama says, So we went there and ended up in the best land under the best protection safe with our religion, not fearing any oppression. And so this brings us to the first hijrah, the first migration that ever took place in Islam. And that was the migration of the first few Muslims from Mecca to Al Habasha to Abyssinia. And so the first group of Muslims set out on this journey. They left secretly from Mecca. And they were 11 men and four women. 11 men and four women. Among them was Um Salama and her husband, Abu Salama. It so happened 
that when they reached the Red Sea, that there were two trading ships that were passing by, and so they were able to get on to these ships that took them to Abyssinia. And so this was, it is recorded that this was in the month of Rajab, which we are currently in, we are currently in the month of Rajab, in the fifth year of the prophethood. In the fifth year of the prophethood. Now, when Quraysh found out about this group of Muslims, they sent after them. But when they reached the shores, they had already left. The Muslims had already left and were on their way to al hadj Now, when this first group went to Abyssinia, it was only a matter of a few months. It was only a matter of a few months. It is mentioned that it was only Ramadan. So after Rajab, you have Sha'ban, and then you have Ramadan. That they heard a rumor. They heard a rumor that Quraysh has accepted Islam. And so Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it is mentioned that he had received Surah Al-Najm. Surah Al-Najm was revealed to him, which he recited to Quraysh. And these verses had a huge impact on them. So when the very last verse was recited, and it was an ayah of sajda, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and those with him, the Muslims, after reciting that last verse, they made sajda. And because of the impact of the surah, it is mentioned that Quraysh also made sajda with them. And so this was the origin of that false rumor that Quraysh had accepted Islam. So those Muslims who had migrated to Abyssinia, they came back to Mecca, but only to find out that it was a false rumor. And so this was when the Prophet وسلم, told them to go back and this time, he sent more with them. This time, he sent more with them. So this is why it is known in the Sirah that there were two migrations to Abyssinia. The first and the second. So the first one was this small group of Muslims. And now the second, the second wave, it composed of 83 men and 18 women, 83 men and 18 women. Now the Muslims had a safe haven to freely practice their deen without fear of persecution. But that didn't mean that Quraysh would leave them alone. And so, the Muslims in Abyssinia were not a threat to Quraysh, not politically nor economically. Nevertheless, they did not want to leave the Muslims alone. And so Quraysh decided to send a delegation to the emperor and Najashi to ask him to turn over these Muslims to them and to send them back. So who did they choose for this mission? They chose Amr ibn al-As and Abdullah ibn Rabi'ah. In another narration, it was Amr ibn Rabi'ah instead of Abdullah ibn Rabi'ah. But the central figure here is Amr ibn al-As. And so, Amr ibn al-As, even before being sent on this mission, he was a diplomat. 
And so he was a very important man to Quraysh who had wide connections. He was in fact friends of uh, people outside of Arabia, like missionaries and uh, officials and uh, diplomats of other countries. And he was also a mastermind in plotting and planning conspiracies against the Muslims especially. So basically, he was the right person for Quraysh to choose. Amr ibn al-As, he went to Abyssinia, and the plan was that he was going to go and meet with the top officials first. He wasn't going to go directly to the Najashi. He was going to go to the bishops and the other officials, and he was going to give them gifts. In other words, he was going to bribe them. He was going to present to them his case and say to them that in your land there are some fools who ran away from us, from Mecca. And we want you to turn them over. So the plan was to work things out first with these top officials before he meets with the Najashi himself. Because if he did that, then when he speaks to the Najashi, he will already have had the approval of the officials. So whatever he says, the officials will agree. And so this is exactly what Amr did. He went to all the officials, he gave them gifts, and he spoke to them. And he also said to them that, look, I prefer that you handle these people without having them to come and meet the Najash. And this was because he was afraid. He was afraid. Afraid of what? He was afraid that they would be able to present their side of the story. Not only that, but he was afraid of the Muslims reciting some of the Quran. And he knew the powerful effect that the Quran had on people. You know, this is not something he was not familiar with. We already spoke about that during you know, the days in Mecca and the Da'wah. Anyhow, Amr, he then went to the Najashi and he told them there are some fools among us who came to land. We know them, they left our religion and they also do not follow yours. He went on and on eventually. He said that we want you to hand them over to us. Now, in the presence of the Najashi are the officials. And so they were already there and they were supporting whatever Muhammad had to say. So what was the response of a Najashi? And Najashi, he said, no, I will not hand you over these people who sought refuge in my land until I hear their side of the story. And this was why Rasulullah told the Muslims to migrate to al Habasha specifically. He mentioned these exact words. He said, there there is a king who in his presence, no injustice is done. No one is dealt with with injustice, with vulnerable. And so he was a man who was just and a man of principles. So in the Jashi, he called the Muslims to come and meet him. The Muslims, they received the message and they were told that Amr ibn al as had met with the Jashi and now the Najashi wants to meet them. So upon hearing this, the Muslims, they got together and they had a shura. They consulted one another and they decided to appoint a spokesperson. Who was this spokesperson? It was Ja'far ibn Abi Talib. 
Jafar ibn Abi Talib was the brother of Ali, and the cousin of the Prophet. They appointed him and they agreed. They agreed that they were going to speak the truth. That no matter what happens, we're only going to speak the truth. We're not going to lie. And so they came to the court of Al Najashi. And an Najashi asked them, what religion do you follow? You left the religion of your people. You didn't join my religion. And you didn't join any of the religions that we know of. So who are you? Now, there's a hadith narrated by Umm Salama, anha, in which the entire speech of Jafar ibn Abi Talib is recorded. And so when an Najashi asked them, who are you? You know, what are you guys about? Jafar ibn Abi Talib, he gave this, he gave this speech. And so let's listen to what he said. Jafar he said, O king, we were a people of shirk. We worshipped idols. We ate the meat of animals that had died and made them. We offended the rules of hospitality and permitted rules that are forbidden, as in shedding one another's blood and so on. If you notice, Jafar began his speech with an intro, telling the Najashi about the chaotic situation that they were living in. The Jahiliya, in the days of Jahiliya, which is something that we spoke about very early on, how the Arabs used to live their lives in complete darkness and in chaos. And so he gave the Najashi this background. Then he went on to say, we completely ignored the matters of right and wrong and, and so God, he sent us a prophet from among ourselves whose honesty and trustworthiness we knew very well. So here, what did he do? He established the credibility of the Prophet You know, pay attention to how the dialogue is, is going and how Ja'far is laying down the foundation and basically effective, effectively giving an Najashi down. So he established the credibility of the Prophet mentioning that Muhammad was known among us. His good character was known among all of us. Then he says, So he summoned us to pray to God alone without associating any partners with him. He told us to respect rights of kinship, to honor the rights of hospitality, to pray to God, to fast for him, and to worship none other than him. So here at Jaffa, he mentioned to an Najashi, he basically informed him of the concepts of Tawheed in Islam and the morals. That Islam teaches. Then he said, and so he called us to God to affirm his oneness, to worship him, and to tear down all the other stones and idols that our forefathers had worshipped besides Allah. He ordered us to be truthful in our speech, to keep other people's trusts, to respect kinship ties and hospitality rights, and to abandon things forbidden and the shedding of blood. He forbade us to do anything immoral, to tell lies, to misuse the funds of orphans, to make false accusations against women of virtue. He ordered us to worship God and to associate no, other, no others with him. He told us to pray, to give a zakah and to fast. Then, Ja'far he enumerated for Al-Najashi all the aspects of Islam. 
So he had mentioned all the good teachings of Islam that no person of good character could ever deny to be good. So notice how he mentioned to him all of these good teachings of Islam, which are universal and which are also teachings that the religion of the Najashi uphold, and that is Christianity. So he made it clear to the Najashi that Islam does not teach anything evil, and that its teachings were not something immoral. Also, he mentioned him, the four pillars of Islam. So he mentioned him, Tawheed, Salah, Fasting, and Zakat. As for Hajj, it was not legislated yet. But these other, these other uh, pillars of Islam have been legislated, even though uh, they had not been legislated fully. So for example, Salah, uh, it was not the five salawat yet. But the concept was there. Lastly, Ja'far, he said, and so we believed in him and trusted him, following him in the instructions that he brought from God. We worshiped God alone without a partner and associating no one with him. We forbade what he had forbidden and considered permissible what he had allowed us. But our people aggressed against us. So now, Ja'far he comes, he comes now after this, you know, after mentioning all of these things, he now comes to the point of discussion, you know, of why the Najashi wanted to meet, meet with them after hearing the case of Amr ibn al Hus and Quraysh. So he said that our people aggressed against us and harmed us, seeking to draw us away from our faith to return us to the worship of idols instead of God and to have us again consider permissible the abominations that we had previously allowed. When they treated us with violence and persecution, preventing us from following our religion, we left our country and chose you above others. We desired your hospitality and we hoped that we would not be harmed in your domain, O King. So notice, the mentioning of persecution was key. Because Amr ibn al-As never mentioned any of that. Not only that, but mentioning the persecution was helpful in bringing mercy to the heart of the Najashi because it would have reminded him of what? of the persecution that the early Christians went through and how they too had to flee with their religion from the Roman Empire before you know before the Roman Empire adopted Christianity as its religion and so before that they were enemies of the Christians and so the Christians had to go underground and they were persecuted And also the persecution of Isa and his disciples. And so after this, the ending of Ja'far was amazing and very effective. After hearing all this, the Najashi he said, Have you brought anything? Have you brought anything with you from what Muhammad has taught you? So now he wanted to hear the Quran. And so he wanted to hear from the revelation. And so Ja'far ibn Abi Talib recited some ayat from the Quran. Which ayat did he choose? Ayat from Surah Maryam. He could have recited anything. But again, again, look at the wisdom of Ja'far and his choice. He chose a surah that would basically seal the deal with an Najashi. 
and so Surah Maryam speaks of Maryam and Isa alayhi salam, something that in the judge she was very, you know, obviously he was very familiar with. And so anything that is mentioned there was information that he already had. And things that he already believed in. And so Um Salama radiallahu anha, she says, I swear, and Najashi, he wept so hard after hearing these ayat that his beard was soaked, and also his bishops, they cried so hard that they wept that their Bibles became wet. So it must have been a very effective and emotional recitation and you know this reaction from an Najashi it reminds us of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about Ahlul Kitab. Ahlul Kitab who are they? Who are Ahlul Kitab? The, the Jews and the Christians. The Jews and the Christians. But in Surah Al-Ma'idah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala differentiates between the Jews and the Christians. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَتَجِدَنَّ أَشَدَّ النَّاسِ عَدَاوَةً لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا الْيَهُودِ وَالَّذِينَ أَشْرَقُوا You will surely find that the most hostile and the most bitter towards the believers are the Jews and the Mushrikun. And this is true. Not only in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, but across our Islamic history until the present. Muslims face persecution at the hands of the Jews and the Mushrikun. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَجِدَنَّ أَقْرَبَهُمْ لَوَدَّةً لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّا نَصَرًا But you will find that those most gracious those most compassionate to the believers are those who call themselves Christians. Allah says that is because there are priests and monks among them and because they are not arrogant. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذَا سَمِعُوا مَا أُنزِلَ إِلَى الرَّسُولِ تَرَى أَعْيُنُهُمْ when they listen to that which has been revealed to the messenger, you see their eyes overflowing with tears, recognizing the truth. They say, Our Lord, we believe, so count us among the witnesses. And then Najashi was one of those. And so after hearing Ja'far and Najashi, he refused to hand over the Muslims to Quraysh. And so the delegation from Quraysh, they left. Amr ibn al-As, he threatened, he threatened that he will make them go back no matter what. You know, he did not want to give up. However, his partner, he told Amr not to say that. You know, Amr, he said, I'm going to force them and I'm going to bring an end to them. And so his partner said, don't say that. And he reminded him that in the end of the day, these are our own blood relatives. And he said, that, look, if they're not going to hand them over, then what can we do? Let's just simply go back to them. But Amr, he said, no. Tomorrow, I'm going to go back. Tomorrow, I'm going to go back to Najashi, and I'm going to tell him that these people, they insult Isa alayhi salam. They call him an abd, a servant. And so that is exactly what he did. The next day he went back to Najashi 
And he said to him that the Muslims, they do not believe that Isa السلام, is divine. They do not believe that he is the son of God. Rather, they call him a servant of God. Now, Ali did not believe in Isa He didn't believe that he is God or the son of God. But he just wanted to cause fitna. And so when Najashi, he became quite concerned when he heard this. And that is because he was a religious Christian. And, you know, uh, they were Orthodox Christians who had adopted the concept of the Trinity. And how God is three. And this is something that in the Joshi believed. So he called the Muslims back. And the Muslims, they decided the same thing. They decided that they're going to speak the truth no matter what. No matter what happens. No matter the consequences. Even if it means that he's going to become upset and he's going to hand us over to Quraysh, we are not going to lie. And so Jafar ibn Abi Talib was once again the spokesperson. When they arrived, and Najashi asked, What do you say about Jesus? So he said, We say that he is the messenger of Allah. He is the word of Allah that was casted upon Maryam, the chaste, and the virgin. So al Najashi, he said, when he heard this, he said, there is no difference. There is no difference between what you say about him and what I say about him. Now immediately, the bishops, they started to cause commotion. And so they were angry about how al Najashi could approve of such a thing. The Christians of Abyssinia, as we mentioned, they were Orthodox who believed in the divinity of Isa alayhi salam. So the priests and the bishops, they did not like what they heard about the Muslims believing that Isa alayhi salam was not a son of God. He was simply a servant of Allah. So in Najashi, he stood up and he said, say whatever you want to say. These people are going to be free in my land. Um Salama, anha, she says that Amr ibn al Has and his partner were left in disgrace because a Najashi drove them out and he even gave them back the gifts. One of the first things that a Najashi asked them when they had come from Mecca was, What have you brought for me? Uh, from your land. So Amr ibn al-As, he said, I brought you some leather products. And leather products were one of al Najashi's favorites. So even though al Najashi and Amr had this relationship of friendship, when it came to principles, al Najashi, he stood by his principles. And he stood by them. And again, this was exactly why the Prophet وسلم, sent these Muslims to him. Out of everywhere where they could have gone, the Prophet وسلم, sent them to him. Because he was just and he was a man of principles. Finally, al Najashi did become a Muslim. However, he was not able to implement Islam. He was not able to enforce it on his people. He was not able to enforce the Sharia. In fact, he had kept his conversion a secret. And he was able to secretly, he could have secretly uh, learned from the Muslims that were there about Islam. And so what proves that he did accept Islam was that 
many years later, Rasulullah said, when he found out about the death of al Najashi, and this hadith is found in Sahih Bukhari, the Prophet said, on this day, on this day, a pious man in Abyssinia has passed away. So let us pray for him. And so the Prophet knew exactly when al Najashi died. And so this is something that Jibreel must have come to him and informed him about. And so the Prophet uh, basically wanted to pray Janazah for him, and he did. In another hadith, the Prophet said, uh, Ask Allah to forgive him. Ask Allah to forgive him. So all of this shows us that the Najashi did accept Islam and he died as a Muslim. And so this is briefly the story of the first Hijrah. We refer to it as the first Hijrah because the second Hijrah of the Muslims was the famous Hijrah that we will come to later on in the Sirah, and that is the Hijrah to Al Medina. But before the Hijrah to Medina, we had this Hijrah, which was to Abyssinia. It was not a Hijrah that was obligatory upon all the Muslims, like the Hijrah to Medina. But it was a relief from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for those Muslims who could not handle the torture and the persecution that they had to undergo in Mecca. And so it was a relief from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enabling them to leave their land in which they could not practice Islam freely and go to a land where they could practice their deen openly and, and freely without the fear of any persecution. Now, there are many lessons that we can learn from the first Hijrah. In fact, the first Hijrah is an event that took place in the Sirah, which is extremely important for Muslims today to study because of the similarity between their situation and our situation today, where we live as a minority among a majority non-Muslim population. And so let us look at some of these lessons there are many that can be learned, but we'll choose some of the most important lessons that uh, we can learn from, uh, from this event. Firstly, what was or what were the reasons for this Hijra to Abyssinia? How come the Muslims fled? their land and went to Abyssinia, how come they left the best place on earth, Mecca, to a strange land, to live as strangers? Not in a Muslim country, but in a non-Muslim country. And so there are a number of reasons that have been mentioned by scholars. The first is the obvious. And that is that Rasulullah allowed them to leave so that they could freely, uh, so that they could free themselves from this physical torture and persecution. Ibn Hazm, he says, when the number of the Muslims increased and the persecution increased, Allah allowed them to migrate. Allah allowed them to migrate. So that is the obvious. That is the obvious. The second reason is to safeguard their faith. <clears throat> and so not everyone would have been able to handle the torture. Some people would give up their iman. Not everyone had the strength of Abu Bakr or Bilal 
رضي الله عنه. And last week we mentioned some of the things that he went to. And how under that severe torture he became even more bolder. Or Khabbab ibn al-Arat. And some of the others who we mentioned last week. And so if a person fears the safety of their deen, then they have to go elsewhere. If they fear that in the current circumstances that I'm in, I'm going to lose my deen, then here they have to move, they have to leave, and go to a place where they can protect their deen. And this is what we find in the story of Ashab al-Kahf, those young men who were one of those early Christians who, you know, they were being persecuted by their people and, and so they fled and went to this cave. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us their story in Surah Al-Kahf. In fact, Surah Al-Kahf, as we mentioned previously, was revealed prior to this hijrah. It was as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was preparing the Muslims that, look, there have been people before you who went through similar suffering to you, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed them to flee. And they fled because of their deen. They wanted to protect their deen. And so Rasulullah says that the believer should not humiliate himself by facing harm which he is unable to handle. So if something is too much for a person to handle, then that person should not, he, he should not leave himself in that situation. Ibn Ishaq, he says, the Muslims then left towards Abyssinia, fearing for their deed. Fearing for their deed. Fearing that, you know, if we stay in this persecution, we're going to end up giving up our deed. So their deed was something valuable to them. Their deed was something valuable to them. They left their homeland. They left their relatives. They left their wealth, their possessions. All because there was something more valuable than all of that to them. And that was their deed. The third reason, some scholars, they mention that the reason why they migrated was to shake the religious and social foundations of Quraysh's most noble and powerful families. Those who migrated to Abyssinia were not only the weak and the powerless. In fact, the majority of them were from families of Quraysh. The majority of them were family of Quraysh. Like Jafar ibn Abi Talib. He was from Quraysh. Uthman radiallahu anhu. Uthman ibn Affan. Also Uthman ibn Mabrur. And others. Um Habiba, the daughter of Abu Sufyan. And so you also had those who were accustomed to providing protection to Rasulullah, such as Zubair and Abdurrahman ibn Awf and Rahman ibn Affan. And so There could be no greater insult or threat to Quraysh, seeing their most powerful and noblest sons and daughters running away for religious reasons, leaving their cultural heritage and their tribal homeland behind. So to make the people 
from the wealthiest and strongest families leave their homes and leave their land was a huge embarrassment for Quraysh. And so Quraysh in Arabia, they had this status. The other tribes of Arabia used to look up for them. Why? Because they were custodians of the Kaaba. And so for people now to see that their, no, their most noblest of people are leaving Mecca, are fleeing away from them for the sake of their religion, this was an embarrassment for Quraysh. And perhaps it was this reason for why Quraysh sent that delegation with Amr ibn al-Aus. Otherwise, what threat did what threat did the Muslims who had left, what threat did they pose to Quraysh? And so it could be that this was why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted them to make hijrah. Finally, another reason that is mentioned by some scholars is that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wanted to have a secondary base outside of Mecca. So that if something happens in Mecca, at least their religion can survive somewhere else. Because until now, Islam was confined within Mecca. Except for a few individuals who had come to Mecca, embraced Islam, and went back to their people. Besides that, there was no other base. And so, since the number of the Muslims had increased, the Muslims could now spare, dividing into two groups. One group stays in Mecca, and the other group would stay in a new land, and that was, in this case, Abyssinia. What supports this view is that even after Rasulullah migrated to Medina, did this group of Muslims in Abyssinia join him in Medina? Did they leave Abyssinia and go to Medina? Migrating to Medina was now a fund. It was an obligation upon all the Muslims. But Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave them instructions to not join them in Medina. And so this group remained in Habasha until the seventh year of the Hijrah. Imagine that, years after the Prophet وسلم, migrated to Medina. Why? Because the Muslims had just now migrated to Medina. A new base. They're still not that strong. Something could still happen to them. They could become annihilated. And so there is the second base in Abyssinia. And so they only joined the Prophet وسلم, once the Prophet وسلم, had established a stronghold in Medina after waging a few wars with their enemies. And so these are among the reasons that scholars have mentioned regarding why the Muslims made that first hijrah. Secondly, how come Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam chose Abyssinia out of all the places that he could have chosen? He could have chosen Yemen, he could have chosen Syria or Iraq or any other place. The first reason is stated in the hadith, in the words of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that we already mentioned. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told these Muslims, go to Abyssinia because therein is a king who does not oppress anyone. So the primary reason for choosing Abyssinia out of all the places that he could have chosen was justice. And so that is why they went to Abyssinia. Secondly, the Arabs were familiar with Habasha, because Quraysh used to do trade and business with them. 
And so there was already this established commercial relationship. Rasulullah also was exposed to uh, Abyssinian culture from a young age. Uh, one of the women who uh, fed him, who nursed him, was from Al Habijah, and that was Um Aina. And so she took care of Rasulullah and breastfed him. In one narration, it states that Um Ayman presented Rasulullah with some food, and he asked, What is this? And so she said that it was an Abyssinian dish which she wanted him to try. And so her culture and her language was Abyssinian, and Rasulullah was close to her even after. Islam, she embraced Islam, and he married her to his adopted son, Zayd ibn Habitha. So the second reason for Abyssinia was that there was already this relationship that had existed. The third reason is that the Abyssinians were Christian, and the Muslims used to see the Christians as being the closest to them compared to the Mushrikun of Quraysh or the Majus of Persia. That's why when the Romans defeated the Persians, it was a day of celebration for the Muslims. Because even though these two people, the Persians and the Romans, are non-Muslims, one was closer to the Muslims than the other. And the Romans, and so the Romans were Christians. So these are among the reasons for choosing Amazon. The third lesson that we learn from the story of the first Hijrah was the firmness and the steadfastness of the Sahaba radiallahu anhu. And so they held tight to their principles. They did not compromise on them, even though they knew that they could be in danger. And so we mentioned how they decided that we are going to speak the truth, no matter what happens. You know, we're in a dangerous situation. Quraysh have come after us now. They're not leaving us alone. They're plotting and planning. What should we do? And so the truth for them was more valuable and more important. Even if it means we're going to be handed over, so be it. And so when they went to a Najashi, they did not lie. They didn't make up a story. They didn't say in order to please him, they didn't say we believe that he is the son of God, Isa alayhi salam. But rather they spoke the truth. What we learn from this is to follow in the footsteps of the Sahaba radiallahu anhu and not to compromise on our deen and our principles. And so for them, their religion came first not their lives. For them, their deen came first, not their lives. Unfortunately, Muslims today, it's not only their life, forget about their lives, but their comfort and their luxuries. They're willing to give up the truth for the sake of their comfortable lives and their luxuries and their convenience. They're willing to compromise for that. And they say, there are Muslims out there who say today, we're living in this society. You know, we shouldn't rock the boat. Well, let us refrain from speaking about certain aspects of Islam, even though they are fundamental aspects of Islam. Why? Because it's going to cause problems in the society in which we're living in. It's going to 
you know, pose a threat to us. And so what we learn from this is something very important. And that is that we should not compromise on the fundamentals of our deed. We should uphold them and speak the truth no matter what happens. The fourth lesson that we learn is that the Sahaba would not give in to the local traditions that would contradict Islamic teachings and principles. However, if there was something that did not contradict with Islam, then they would adopt it. And so, this is a, a very important lesson for us to learn as well. That when you live in a society of non-Muslims, Hold on to your deen and do not imitate the people around you. Do not adopt their way of life. Do not adopt their practices and their habits. If they contradict the teachings of Islam. If they don't contradict the teachings of Islam, then there's nothing wrong with that. But where they contradict the teachings of Islam, we have to oppose. And we cannot adopt those practices. And so where do we learn this? In the story of the Hijrah, Amr ibn al-As, when he came to the Najashi, he said to him, beware, for these people they come to you. When these Muslims come to you, beware. They will not make sujood for you. And it was a custom of the people that whoever enters upon the Najashi, they would make sujood. And so when they came in, when the Muslims came in, indeed, Amr ibn al-As was correct, and they did not make sujood. So the Najashi became angry, and he asked them why they didn't make sujood, like everybody else. And so the Muslims, they said, we do not make sujood to anyone besides Allah. And so this is a very, very important lesson for us. Since we live as a minority, it does not mean that we blend in and we assimilate into this society, adopting the way of life of the kuffar, imitating them, especially in those things that contradict the teaching of Islam, especially matters related to our aqidah and our beliefs. The fifth lesson that we learn is the importance of being organized and appointing a leader. And so what we learned in this story was that the Muslims, when they were told that the Najashi wants to speak to them, they came together. And they did shura, they consulted one another. It was not that one of them said, okay, I'm going to go, and he's not going to uh, consult anyone. No, they came together. They devised a plan. They were organized. And they said, only one of us is going to speak. So that, you know, it doesn't look like we're unorganized. And we are chaotic. And so they appointed a leader, a spokesperson, and that was Jafar ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. And so this teaches us that Muslims, wherever we are, we have to live in an organized way. We have to have a jama'ah and work together. And so Islam is not an individual thing where you do it on your own. But rather many of the teachings of Islam are on a collective level that teach us the spirit of al -Jana'a. The sixth lesson that we learn is that living in a non-Muslim land comes with a lot of fitna. And fitna is of two kinds. You have the fitna of shubuhat, of doubts, you know, doubts concerning Islam, that the enemies of Islam, they spread 
you know, is Islam the truth? Is it not doubts concerning Allah's existence, for example? Shubuhat. And the other kind of fitna is the fitna of shahawat. Lustful desires. And so, we see when the Muslims were in al habasha they were surrounded by fitna. Because they are living in a society that does not enforce the Sharia. And so, Um Habiba, we mentioned, was the daughter of Abu Sufyan. And she was one of the early Muslims. For her to leave her luxurious life and migrate was a big sacrifice. You know, she was a daughter of one of the leaders of Quraysh, Abu Sufyan. Abyssinia was a foreign land for her. When her husband reached Abyssinia, he apostated. He left Islam. Ubaidullah ibn Jahsh was his name. And this was a man who went through different phases in his life. He kept on flipping back and forth, uh, switching religions. Eventually, when he reached Abyssinia, he became a Christian. And the most influential person for a woman is her husband. And so Umm Habiba went through a very difficult time. Imagine. She is all alone now. She had to separate because, you know, a Muslim woman cannot remain with a Catholic husband. But keeping in mind all of these factors, you know, keeping in mind that she comes from a prestigious family, she could easily go back to the comfort of her home. Uh, she's a woman all by herself. She remained strong and steadfast and was able to hold on firm to her deen even under these circumstances. And so without a doubt, when you are living among non-Muslims, you're going to be faced with the fitna of shubuhat and the fitna of shahawat. And what that requires from us is to oppose and remain strong and steadfast in the face of these tests and these trials. Finally, the last point. What is the ruling of Hijrah in Islam? And so, the scholars, they mention that if a Muslim is unable to establish the essential practices of Islam, then they must go elsewhere. They must make Hijrah. Hijrah, in this case, becomes obligatory. When one is unable to freely and openly practice the essential aspects of Islam, then he has to find another home. In this case, Hijrah becomes wajib. However, if a Muslim is able to establish the essential teachings of Islam and freely practice Islam without hindrance, then in this case, he does not have to leave, but Hijrah is mustahab, is encouraged. This is what Shaykh Ibn Al-Taymin mentions. That we have these two rulings for Hijrah. One where it is obligatory, and one where it is not obligatory, but it is encouraged. And so that's because of the consensus of the Muslims that it is not allowed for Muslims to live among non-Muslims. Due to many ahadith. Among the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ says, I have nothing to do with a Muslim who lives among the mushrikun. And so this is a warning for those who wish to remain living among non-Muslims. Now the scholars have mentioned various conditions that allow a Muslim to live in a non-Muslim. Again, Shaykh ibn Uthaymeen, he mentions these conditions. He says, the first, 
that he has to have knowledge by which he can protect his aqidah and his iman from shubuhat. And then he explains how, you know, in non-Muslim lands, the enemies of Islam are active in spreading lies about Islam and doubts. And these doubts are going to enter the hearts of any Muslims who live in those lands. Without it. So the condition to live there is you have to have knowledge that can protect you from the shubha. The second, he says, that he has iman and a strong deed by which he can protect himself from shahwa. And so, when you have shahwat that are open all around you, and access to it is so easy, you need to have strong iman and strong deen in order to oppose that. Thirdly, he says that there has to be a reason for why he is living there. Like, he happened to be born there. It's not that he came here on his own choice. Or he went there to study. To study something that, you know, is not available in Muslim lands. Or he went there for business. Or he went there for medical treatment. Or he went there for that one purpose. So the point is that there has to be a reason for why Muslims you know, leave their Muslim countries and come to live uh, in a non-Muslim country. And so this is what he mentions, and uh, this is what we can briefly uh, summarize concerning the ruling of Hijrah in Islam. And with that, we come to the end of this very, very important event in the Sirah and the life of the Prophet Next week, we'll move on to uh, a few major events that happened uh, after this, uh, after this period of the first hijrah. Until then, subhanakallah wa bihamdik, ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant, astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk, wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiya Muhammad, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in, wa sallamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.